We're going to pick up at verse 18 today and finish the chapter with us together this morning. So, let me find John. Here we go. I'm going to read for you the first, uh, actually these first verses, and I'm also going to lead into chapter 16, the first four verses. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to elaborate more so on these verses, kind of line by line and verse by verse as we do. Um, so let's read the Word of God together. I'll read. You guys follow. It starts off in uh, chapter 15 of the Gospel of John, verse 18. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you are of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would, have, they would have no sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Verse 23. He who hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would have no sin. But now they have seen and also hated both me and my father. Verse 25. But this happened that the word might be fulfilled, which is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. Verse 26. But when the helper comes, whom I send to you from the father, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the father, he will testify of me. And you also will bear witness because, of, because you have been with me from the beginning. Chapter 16, verse 1. These things I have spoken to you that you should not be made to stumble. They will, be, they will put you out of the synagogues, yes. The time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God service. And these things they will do to you because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things I have told you that when the time comes, you may remember that I told you of them, and these things I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. Lord, we do thank you for your word. And I thank you, Lord, that we're here to, to look at your word, to parse your word, to um, examine your word truly, Lord, and apply it to our lives, Lord. Let us make sense of what Jesus is, is saying to the disciples about others and the responsibility to themselves, uh, to them as well as disciples, apostles of Christ. And so, God, uh, move in us and through us this morning, Lord. May your Holy Spirit bring to us illumination and revelation by your Holy Spirit this morning because that's his purpose. That's, that's one of the things he does, and we thank you for that. So, God, bless this time of study, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. It's interesting that in, verse, in chapter 15, and by the way, if anybody needs a Bible, please raise your hand. We'd love to have you use a Bible during our time of study this morning. But in, in chapter 15, Jesus ends in verse 17. He says, these things I command you that you love one another. Very interesting, I think, because the very next verse, Jesus says, oh, uh, guess what? The world's going to hate you. But he said, I want you to love others. It's a command. Even though, understand, the world is going to hate you. What I see in verses 18 and 19 is pretty much two characteristics or two characters, if you will, of what Jesus has been speaking of. One is, as we know full well, he spoke to us of the character of the kingdom. And the character of the kingdom is that of love. He says, love one another. If you love others, um, you'll be blessed. If, if, you, uh, if you, though others will know you by your love for one another, uh, love me or love the Father, uh, those types of things. Everything, the character of the kingdom is all wrapped around in love. But now he speaks about the character of the world. And quite specifically, he says, the character of the world is one of hatred. Hatred. That word means detest. 
So Jesus is saying, listen, guys, the world detests you. You know what that word means. Can't stand you because of who you represent. And so in that, Jesus is warning that the way the world distinguishes its children from God's children. You, you follow me? That's what Jesus is doing. He says, listen, my children, they love. They hate sin, but they love the sinner. They, they love one another and as I have loved you. John 15, 9. Um, it's out in our, in our lobby. And so that is the, the message of the kingdom of Jesus. The children of the kingdom is a message of love. Yet we see that, the, that, the, that Jesus is warning and he gives us the, the, the distinguishing point of what is a child of God or a child of the kingdom and who or what is a child of the world. And Jesus says that the child of, of the world, a way to distinguish that, is that um, he's found, this child is only found in the world where, where hatred is found. And that person is different than a child of God. That the interest of a child of the world is one of the God of the world. That's the only interest that a child of the world has. They bear an image. Remember, every child, even in its physiological sense, bears the image of their parents. You can tell the, which children belong to which parents because of a likeness that they bear. They resemble their parents in their eyes or their noses or their facial features, uh, maybe hair color, things of that nature. They bear a resemblance. They have an image. And Jesus is speaking here that these children, children of the world, bear an image of their parent, the world. All right? That's what he's talking about here. He's talking about the difference between children of God and children of the world. And so, conversely, those who are children of God will bear the image of Jesus. They will have a likeness of Jesus. And so these children, these, these children of the world that Jesus is referring to to the disciples are ones who hate Christians or will hate them for who they represent. Know this, that if you're a Christian here this morning and you're saved, that the world hates you. Bottom line. Why? Because the world belongs to the prince of the air, who is Satan. And because of that, everything about the world is against you as a Christian. The world doesn't want to see a Christian succeed. The world doesn't want to hear a Christian uh, bear the name or lift up the name or stand for the name of Jesus. The, the, the world doesn't want that. And it's evidenced already in our nation, it's evidenced in our public schools, it's evidenced in what uh, our nation's leaders are trying to do with God by eliminating him from every area of our nation, of, of our leadership in our nation. That's what they're trying to do. And they're trying to lead now our country into more of a socialistic type of country. And then I'll just tell you, that's not good. And it's all because the world hates the things of God. So know this. As Jesus says later on that they will persecute you for my name's sake, if you're a Christian, be ready for persecution. Be ready. Because it's only going to get tougher. It's only going to get harder. Because as the world machine continues to grow and amp up and move forward, it's going to literally want to run over anyone who claims the name of Jesus. Now, a lot of people claim the name of God. You mention God to anybody, oh, it's God. It's God. No problem, God. Yeah, I believe in God. You believe in God. I believe in God. He believes in God. She believes in God. It's all God. We're all God-friendly. But you name the name of Jesus, 
and hairs on the back of people's necks stand up. And their, their looks look differently at that time now. They're going to kind of be more cautious about you. Oh, you're one of those Jesus people, aren't you? Well, Jesus here says in his word that if you don't like me, guess what? You know nothing about God the Father. Absolutely nothing. Because I come from him. I'm his messenger. I, I'm, I'm his apostle. I'm his missionary from heaven. And if you don't believe in me, guess what? You don't believe in him. Why? Jesus says, because he's the one that sent me to you all. So it's not about God. That's not the issue. But the name of Jesus is the one that really messes with people's minds. And it is interesting in that that when we see whether it's Jew or Gentile, bond or free, I don't care what it is, a child of the world bears the same likeness, the same image of the world. You see, a child of the world is 100% devoted to this world and to the things of it and never thinks of another world. They're always in the world, thinking about the world, the things of the world. That denotes a child of the world. A child of God, though, is taught to love. A child of God is taught to hate sin, but love the sinner. You know, regardless of what anybody is involved with or involved in in their personal lives, if they're in an area of sin in their lives, guess what? You love them. You just don't approve of that lifestyle or you don't approve of what's going on in their lives at that time. But, but that's, 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 that's two different things. You don't dislike the person. You don't dis or hate the person. But you love them. And you accept them for where they're at. And then you pray that God is just going to reveal things to them in their timing and move them along the way. To love, a child of God, is to love and to do good to everyone and to have that same likeness as Jesus Christ, you see. That, that's that's the, 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 the image that is born upon a person who says, I'm a child of God. You have those attributes, those characteristics, not characteristics of the world, of what the world says. What's your thought life like? What do you watch on television? What do you listen to? What activities are you involved with? You got to look. Are they worldly things? Hmm. Or are they kingdom things? Okay. If you're honest with yourself, then you'll be able to answer that question accurately and correctly. You know, it's interesting, but it's true that you can bring two people of the same, uh, of the same world together in the sense in the same room, and they agree at nothing. Absolutely nothing. They're polar opposites politically. They're polar opposites professionally. They're polar opposites socioeconomically. They, they don't even like each other. All right? Let's say that much. But if they're unbelievers, they agree on one thing. They hate Jesus. And they can agree on that one thing. It's interesting how Jesus can be not only a divider, but he also can be something in common to people who do not like Jesus and want nothing to do with Jesus Christ. Turn in your Bibles with me to 1 John, off to the right in the New Testament. And we'll see a little bit about what John says, just a little bit more descript in that. Let me get to it myself. There's 3 John. Okay, that's 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. It says to us, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. So it's love, you see. God, by his love, has given to us, bestowed to us, uh, the name to be called children of God. Therefore, because of that, the world does not know us because it did not know him. You see? That's what it comes down to. 
It's like the world does not know you, the Jesus in you, because they don't even know God himself. Let's skip down a little bit to verses 10 through 13. In this, of the same chapter, in this the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest, meaning they're shown. Because before that he's talking about who's born of God and who's born of the world. Because it says in verse 9, whoever's been born of God does not sin, for a seed remains in him and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. Does that mean that we never sin? No. But what that means is that we're not to live our lives in a practice of sin. We're not to be practicing sin without any repentance. So that's when he says in verse 10, in this, in that what he just spoke on, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Meaning that if you're doing the things of the world, if you're involved in the things of the world, you're partaking of the things of the world, you think like a worldly person, you think... Now, the Bible in Corinthians speaks of this kind of a Christian even. Let's just not even talk about an unbeliever. We can say, well, that's an unbeliever. I understand that. But let's talk about a Christian. Corinthians describes to us a carnal Christian, one who is, says they're a Christian and is saved, yet they're continuing to want to be living a life that is given over to the world. That, according to the Apostle Paul, is carnality. It's flesh. You know, it's not the fact that that person is truly trying to overcome that temptation or trying to get counsel or trying to uh, be accountable to other people for that temptation in their life even. But they've given themselves over to the worldly life, the worldly thoughts, the worldly things, yet they're a Christian still. Are there carnal Christians? The answer is yes. There are carnal Christians. Sounds like an oxymoron, though, doesn't it? It is. But by God's grace, he allows his spirit now to begin doing a work in you. Begins eliminating those things from your life. If you're willing, if you're desiring to change, he wants to bring those things out from you. Because if we're so filled up with the things of the world, that means there's no room for the things of God because you're kind of tapped out. You're filled up. But, but the Spirit is going to want to begin eliminating those things of the world from your life and begin increasing the things of Him in your life. Does that mean that you're perfect? No. That means you're being sanctified. It's a sanctified walk. You're learning as you're going. You're walking. That's why it's not a sprint. That's why it's not a... Not a, not a fast race or we'd all be lost out, right? But it's a marathon race. It's a walk. And we walk and we seek the Lord and we get counsel and we get counsel by the Spirit and we read His Word and those things in our lives, they change us and they transform us from this stage to this stage and that metamorphosis stage to where I'm not looking anything like I did yesterday, but I'm looking more like Jesus today. See, that's the idea. So we don't teach, and the Bible doesn't teach, sinless perfection because we're all sinners and we're all saved by grace. We all bring a lot of baggage to the Lord but, and God wants to get the glory to, to redeem you, to, 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 to take those things from your life so that he can get the glory. And so in this, we see even as, as, as John speaks about the importance of love and sin and the child of God and things like that, um, that it's important that we do try, that we do want to grow in our relationship with the Lord, that we want to be able to look at our lives realistically and then say, no, Lord, I don't want this a part of my life anymore. I want to grow. I want to get off the milk and I want to get into the meat of the word. In verse 19, he's saying here that if you were of the world, the world would love its own. It's pretty, makes sense, doesn't it? That word of means from the world. So the world would know, hey, hey, guess what? You belong to me. You're mine. I can tell. How can I tell? Because you think like me. You act like me. You talk like me. You walk like me. You look like me. You see, that's the world talking to its own children. Hey, bambino, come here. Come to papa. Let's, let's hug. Let's have a group hug here. That's what, that's what the world does to its children. 
It recognizes its own children because its children are an image and bears the stamp image of its parent, the world. So it's very important, children of God, listen up, that we indeed look at the characteristics of Christ and the characteristics of the kingdom of God and we seek to emulate those things in our lives. That's what's important. John 18, 36, Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my first servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews, but now my kingdom is not from here. Know this, you guys, your kingdom, your world is not this place. The Bible says you are and I are but sojourners, pilgrims on this short life we call for the 70, 80, 90 years that God blesses us with or 100 years, whatever it is. It's like it's just but a vapor, the, the Bible says. It's so quick compared to eternity and the life we're going to spend with our, with our Savior. So that's why it says don't, don't, don't pack things up here in the world because it's going to be gone soon. Wood, hay, stubble, that all burns away. And so what, what are you to be doing as Christians then? What are you to be doing as, as children of the kingdom? Well, the children of the kingdom are to be looking to be involved with the things of the kingdom, the things of heaven, the things of God. That's what we're called to be associated with and affiliated with not the things of the world. Jesus charges his children to love one another. The world loves its own offspring. Understand that. The world loves its own offspring, and they are discipled in the ways of the world. You think in church we talk about discipleship. Discipleship, discipleship. Raising people up under the disciplines or the teachings of others. Well, know this. There's also a discipleship process in the world, equally as powerful, and in many cases way more consistent and diligent than the ways of the church. It really racks me up sometimes when, when uh, we see young, children, young people getting involved in gangs or getting involved in this or that because they need to be accepted or they're looking for love or they're looking for acceptance or they're looking for hope of something and they're not finding it in their own church. So... The world hates Jesus, he, uh, and, G and the children of Jesus, our Lord is saying. And the world hates those who Jesus blesses. The world curses those people. Those who are special to God have never been special to the world. You know, a lot of times, you know, the whole book of Hebrews is one that teaches us that they just want to go back to the way they were. The world never loved you. Understand this. The world hates you, detests you. That's the world. But yet we go back to it, don't we? Yet we fall prey to the temptations of it, don't we? What do we think we're getting out of it? I don't know. But we all fall short, don't we? But for the grace of God, after we repent... He brings us back into right relationship and fellowship with him. Spiritually looking at the world and at the kingdom, Cain and Abel. Cain killed Abel because the offering of Abel was accepted. Jacob and Esau, because of the blessing. Saul and David, because the Lord was with David. Ahab and Micaiah because of the prophecies of Micaiah against Ahab. In verses 20 and 25, Jesus now says, listen, you're going to suffer. You're going to suffer. Now, to me, that, that, that like goes against all the faith and prosperity doctrinal teachings um, all that kind of stuff because a lot of churches teach that, well, 
If only you had more faith, then you wouldn't be suffering. Or because you had more, if you don't have more faith, then you wouldn't be going through this situation. But you have to have more faith, more faith, more faith, because you're being persecuted. No. Not true. False. The Bible promises me and tells me that if I'm a child of God, if you're a child of God, there will be persecution. It's just the way it is. Nothing to do with your faith. It's guilt by association. Who you're hanging out with. If you're hanging out with Jesus and you bear his name, lift his name, stand for his name, guess what? You will be persecuted. If you're not being persecuted too much lately, I'd have to take a look and reevaluate. Are you standing, bearing, and lifting up the name of Christ to others? So, so in that... Um, Jesus says, listen, I'm suffering. I'm going to suffer. And guess what? You're going to suffer too. 2 Timothy 3.12 states this. Timothy writes, yes, and all who desire to live godly. Let's just talking about living godly. I'm not talking about being a pastor. I'm not talking about being in leadership in a church. I'm not talking about going out on a street corner and, and having rotten tomatoes thrown at you. I'm not talking about any of that. I'm just talking here. 2 Timothy says, and all who desire to live godly in Christ will suffer persecution. If you just desire to live godly and establish and stand for the godly principles in your home, in your family, in your relationship with your wife or husband, with your children, you're trying to stay, take a stand and bear the name of Christ, lift up his name in your home and stand for the things of Jesus in your home, guess what? Just to live godly, Timothy says, you're going to have persecution. That's just living godly. Well, he also says in, 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 in another translation of that same verse, yes, all whose purpose is to be living in the knowledge of God in Christ Jesus will be cruelly attacked. It's a purpose. Desire means it's a purpose behind it. So if you're purposing, just simply purposing to live godly, saying, Lord, I want to live for you. Lord, I don't want to do the things I did before. I don't want to do the things I did yesterday. I don't want to think those things. Just by that alone, guess what? You're going to be persecuted. It's a purpose thing that you need to do in your lives. Jesus know, knew and knows that his children, his guys... His representatives, his, his ambassadors, they will suffer and they will be cruelly attacked. That's what Jesus is saying. In fact, Psalm 69.4, David, who is a type of Christ, says this, Those who hate me without a cause are more than the hairs on my head. Have you guys counted how many hairs on your head? Well, those are how many were against David. There are, there are, they are mighty who would destroy me, being my enemies wrongfully. Though I have stolen nothing, I still must restore it. So even in that, we're seeing here that Jesus is like saying, those people that are against me, I've done absolutely nothing to provoke their anger. Absolutely nothing to make them all feel like uh, uh, they're going to lose something here. And, and, but still, they hate me for it. They're going to crucify me for it. But yet, I'm going to be restoring things through this. Pretty amazing. He still, in spite of them hating him, despising him, detesting him, still is saying, I'm making a way even for you who's going to put the nails in my hand. I love you that much. You see? Verses 26 and 27, we see here that but when the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. Jesus has spoken already about incredible opposition that the gospel was to meet with the world head on. Boom, head on. The gospel in the world, the truth of God, hitting head on with what's the truth of the world, quote unquote. And they're going to hit head on like two rams or, or cars in a demolition derby or something. They're just going to just hit head on. And so there's opposition that the gospel was meeting with the world back then as it is today. 
and that the hardships would be put on those who do lift up, stand up, and bear the name of Christ. There's hardships for those people. Yet provision is made by God through Jesus Christ for you, which is called His Holy Spirit. And I think that's great. The testimonies of his apostles too. We'll read in verse 27 that very same thing. Not only the Holy Spirit is to testify, but he says, you also, you also guys, you by your lives are going to bear witness of me. The promise of the Holy Spirit says that Jesus, now this is the idea. Jesus ascends into heaven. And as Jesus ascends into heaven, he says, I'm going to leave you this helper. Why did he leave us the helper? The helper, the advocate, the paraclete, the one who comes alongside us, gives us guidance, gives us teachings, gives us instruction. That still small voice by the Holy Spirit into our lives. The reason I believe is so that Jesus here is saying, listen, I'm sending you this helper for you, of me, because he, through you, will now maintain my cause. Everything that I have done, everything that I have said, is going to be maintained by the Holy Spirit through the children, through you guys. That's what the Holy Spirit does. And it's the cause of Christ in the world. Amidst all this opposition and flack that the gospel gets from the world. The Holy Spirit is being brought, has been brought here to be implanted in each of you so that you would carry on the message of Christ to the world against the opposition. We think we have it tough here. We'll just think about those guys back there being under that direct Roman umbrella. They had it in their face. They didn't have any senators or congressmen or women or, who, are, who are advocates and trying to do well, like in room 219 up at the Capitol. Guys, you know, men and women who love Jesus, who are praying every day for our nation. They didn't have any of that. Everything of the establishment, the government was against them. Yet they persevered. And they persevered against that kind of opposition, one of which you and I don't even know about. But it may be coming soon. The helper, the comforter, is also our advocate who comes from the Father. And one who, 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 who Jesus sends to supply. He's kind of like our supply of sorts because the bodily presence of Christ was no longer with, to be with them. Or with us. So he sends this helper, this guy, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, who's going to guide you into all truth, just like Jesus did when he was with his men on earth. The same thing. The same mission. The Holy Spirit, spoken of here in the Word and the Word of God, is a distinct person. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. The Holy Spirit is a distinct person, a distinct individual. He's not a quality. He's not an essence, but a person under a proper name. And that name is the Spirit of Truth. That's who He is. The Spirit's mission, He will, number one, He will come in giving abilities and gifts and grace and power. Galatians 5.16 says, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust in the flesh. He gives you the power to overcome. He gives you the ability to see things before you get involved in them if you're seeking Him. See, that's the, the, one of the ministries of the Holy Spirit to guide you, instruct you, and to teach you. And you have to be willing to submit to the Spirit's authority in Christ for your life. We have to if we want to actually prosper in this life spiritually. Galatians 5.18 says, but if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. So the other types of ministries the Spirit does, He leads you. He brings you into good things, not bad things, good things. Galatians 5.22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Just characteristics, manifestations of having a Spirit-filled life. Second thing that the Spirit does, one of his offices, is that 
uh, the teachings. He knew, Jesus knew, that his teachings would be rejected. And Jesus means that whatever words or actions you may have and, and kept, guess what? They won't even listen to you. And you need the Spirit. You need the Holy Spirit. In closing, we see that the final part, verse, chapter 16, verses 1 through 4, Jesus is telling us why. He says, These things I have spoken to you that you should not be made to stumble. They will, be put, they will put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God a service. And these things they will do to you because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things I have told you that when the time comes, you may remember that I told you of them. And these things I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. So Jesus is saying, listen, all of these things that I've said to you that are to come, I'm telling you now, because I've been with you these three and a half years, and because these three and a half years I've been with you, I've not needed to tell you or to uh, warn you of these things that are happening. I've not needed to do that. Oh, welcome youth. But he says, listen here. He goes, I've spoken to you these things that you should not be made to stumble. Wow, Jesus didn't tell me this was going to happen. Jesus didn't let me in on this secret. You know, I think it's beneficial that Jesus doesn't let us in on everything because um, if we actually knew it, we would probably wonder if we wanted to really be a believer or not. If we wanted to follow him or not. If Jesus told you that you would suffer cancer or you would suffer something debilitating or have a tragic loss in your family because of your Christianity you might think twice about following Christ but Jesus said that you will and I will suffer persecution and he says guess what they're going to put you out of the synagogues they're going to, they're going to ostracize you from the things that they believe are righteous that are right. And he says, and the time is coming that whoever kills you, so that means that they're going to die. You will think that, that he offers God service like they're doing it in the name of God. And he says, and these things they will do to you because they have not known the Father nor me. So he's like, hey, if you don't even know me, that means that you, you don't even get the Father. You don't understand who the Father is. But I've told you that you'll remember so you'll remember that when you go through a time of persecution, you go through a time of trial, you'll remember that I did tell you about these things. You go through a time of persecution, you will remember that I, that I told you that because of me, it's okay you're going through this persecution. It's okay because it's for me. Blessed are those who are persecuted for my name's sake, says Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are you who are persecuted for my namesake, he says. You see, that's the thing. And so Jesus here is continuing to tell them, hey, you know what? Don't turn back. That's the title of this morning's message, is, is, is no turning back. You can't turn back. I guess you can, but that would be called apostate. But you cannot turn back. You really have no choice. If you want Jesus in your life and you want him to be involved in your life, you have to follow him 100%. It's not 90%. It's not 98%. It's 100%. I'm sorry, but that's what the Bible says. It's not my theology. It's what the Word says. It's 100%. It's not 20% only on Sundays and on Wednesday nights and then, uh, well, part of my mind is given over to only to God, but then the other part is given over to the world. Mm, Jesus says, you know what? You're lukewarm, man. And if you're lukewarm, I'm going to spit you out. I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. It's kind of graphic, but it kind of says what it says. I'm going to vomit you right out.
Why do we vomit? To purge an impurity, something in our system, that our system, our body is saying, ain't good for us. It's not beneficial to be in here. And Jesus says the same thing. Don't be hot or cold, or be hot or be cold. One or the other. Make your mind up, but don't be lukewarm because it's not good. No turning back. There's no reason to turn back. And as Matthew comes on up here and um, finishes us in, in our worship song this evening or this morning, you know, I want you guys to think about this message of Jesus. He says the, to love one another, to love the commandment, but the world's going to hate you. Wow. Can you do that? You can't do that without the Holy Spirit. I want you to know that. I'm going to invite the ushers up here too. And so during this time, guys, as we play this worship song and we close the service this morning in communion, you know, Jesus said that he wanted us to remember him by doing this. Remember your covenant with the Lord. Remember your commitment to the Lord. That day when, you, when the Lord came into your life and you said, I do, to him. Remember that. That is not to live a lukewarm Christian life, but to live 100% for Christ. It doesn't mean you become a pastor. It doesn't mean you plant a church. Uh, it doesn't mean any of those things, but you, but you and I must be identified as children of God, not as children of the world. That if you bear a likeness of the world, that means you're involved in the world. If you bear a likeness of the kingdom of heaven, that means that you're involved in the kingdom of heaven. Hey, that's what the word says. If you have a problem, take it up with the Lord. That's his word. You'll lose in that debate. You'll lose. He always wins. He loves you guys. And I want you to know that as we remember communion, the reason why because he does love you. He's never stopped loving you to the point of death. And he didn't leave us with nothing. He says, I'm going to leave you my Holy Spirit to guide you, to teach you, to love on you even more because I'm not going to be here. And he says, I don't want you to turn back. I don't want you to go back to the former things of your life. I want you to, to remain constant. The legacy of Christ continues with you by the Holy Spirit. It continues with you. His message, the gospel that was started back with his, with his 11 apostles ultimately and the apostle Paul and others. That legacy continues with you. Is that not amazing? You're a direct descendant of the apostles spiritually. Started with them. And so, you know what? If you want to be used even more by the Lord, you don't want to turn back. Maybe you're at a time of turning back or thinking about things. You're like, man, I don't want to be a part of the world because the world does hate me. Ask God just to give me the power to overcome that. Because he will. As the guys start handing out the elements, I'll begin praying. Lord, we thank you for this time, and I thank you for your word. I thank you, God, that you brought us here to this place so that we can read your word, and that we can desire, God, for that word to richly dwell in our lives. That, Lord, that no matter what's going on in our lives, Lord, we can always rest and remember that you have left us your helper, one who will teach us and guide us and instruct us in all things, and that you, God, have never left us nor forsaken us. So, Lord, this morning, whether young or, or not, Lord, whatever age we are, whatever we're struggling with, asking God to 
deliver us, to give us the confidence. And by faith, to believe that you can do all things, Lord. And so God, this morning, minister to the hearts and minds of the people here. 